Hey everyone, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the first of three modules on social emotional learning. Uh, we're calling this foundational elements of social awareness and relationship building. This module series is a part of the Healing Together initiative, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, uh, through the Office of Student Support Services in the school district where you're from and where you all are educators. Little about myself, uh, my name is Richard Fournier. I'm the Managing Director of Programs at Transforming Education. I'm also a former teacher, administrator, uh, and education researcher. Transforming Education is a national nonprofit and we work to support systems level change for the whole child. And we do this with districts and schools across the US. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this initiative with you today and, and for the next few modules. Um, in times before COVID, uh, of course, I'd likely be facilitating this in person. So I'm gonna try my best today to give this voiceover without uh, sounding like a robot. And um, hopefully I can keep this as authentic as possible. Okay, so here's today's agenda. We're gonna start off with a real brief overview of the module series, so you know what's coming. We're gonna talk a little bit uh, more deeply about today's objectives. And then we'll dive into uh, why social and emotional learning is important. So we'll look at some of the research behind it. Uh, again, very brief. Uh, and then we'll go into social awareness, some of the definitions, various components of it, and we'll look at some strategies uh, that you may or may not already be using in your, in your classroom or your school. And we'll do the same thing with relationship building. And then we'll wrap up with uh, next steps. So <clears throat> the purpose of the following three modules that you'll be engaging in is really to provide educators with a foundational knowledge around social emotional learning. And in particular, as I just mentioned, social awareness and relationship building. I'll mention this again a little bit later, but these two competencies uh, were chosen in part because of course we have limited time, so we can't cover the entire spectrum of SEL. But also if you think about social awareness and relationship building, uh, we think these are gonna be really critical uh, skills and areas to focus on with fall reopening uh, and really throughout the year, um, particularly for those of us that will be in the distance learning virtual context. Uh, each of these modules will have reflection and discussion uh, activities. For those of you that are running the video and, and facilitating, <clears throat> you'll see an icon, as I'll explain later, uh, so you'll know when to, uh, so when to pause the, the video. So the first module, we're going to dive a little bit more into content and strategies. And in module two, we're going to provide more depth on SEL integration into practice. So what are some of those uh, pedagogical practices and strategies which which you are already using on a daily basis, basis um, that you can leverage for integrating these strategies. And then in module three, we'll provide some application activities so that we can put the information in the first two modules uh, into action and into planning. So let's start off with looking a little more closely at our objectives today. Today, we aim to acquire the following. Uh, we want to gain a deeper understanding of the importance of SEL, particularly as it relates to academic learning and, and lifelong success. We want a deeper awareness of evidence-based strategies around these competencies. We'll have some opportunities to uh, explore some, a couple of videos. Um, you did have some articles for your pre-work, so hopefully you had a chance to read or at least skim those. And we'll also have opportunities to reflect on these competencies um, based on whatever role you play in, in your school. So today, I just want to review a couple things, a couple requests. Um, let's practice, you know, a little self-awareness. Um, want to be aware of ourselves, uh, who we are as an educator, who we are as an individual uh, that belongs to a larger group uh, in society. Want to be reflective. Um, let's try to be reflective of, of your practice and um, also level of engagement in today's session. And also, of course, take care of your needs. Uh, if you need a restroom break or you have a question, um, obviously, please uh, do that throughout. We also want to be an active participant. So, you know, as practitioners, uh, you may already be practicing many of these concepts we'll discuss today, but 
you know, we want to remember to listen to understand. Um, so when engaging in large group discussions, you know, take the time to listen to what your colleagues contribute to the dialogue. Ask clarifying questions, you know, obviously feel free to engage with each other um, and give feedback uh, either to your colleagues or, or to us running these sessions. You'll see these icons at the bottom here. So I just want to mention quickly, one is signaling for participation. So if you see that, it's probably meaning that there's some kind of uh, group discussion uh, coming up. Uh, and if you see the pause icon, um, just listen for me to uh, request that you pause it and uh, then you can uh, continue on playing as soon as the activity is done. All right, so <clears throat> just a quick look at, you know, why SEL is important. At Transforming Education, we, we really arrive at SEL through an evidence-based research lens. So we, we believe that success in school and in life uh, depends on more than you know, just academic ability. Um, and we know from rigorous longitudinal research um, that competen competencies and skills around things such as growth mindset, uh, self-efficacy, self-management, social, social awareness, uh, have a, a significant impact on a student's academic performance and also in their broader life success. Additionally, we know that these interpersonal and intrapersonal competencies uh, predict grades throughout K-12 as strongly as IQ does, and they predict performance in the workforce more strongly than IQ does. We know that these types of skills uh, are very much high in demand by employers um, across the US and, and globally. Um, and we also know that having strength in these areas is, is very much correlated with long-term outcomes, such as high employment rates and wages, um, as well as lower risk of substance abuse, obesity, and criminal activity. So in summary, uh, we know that SEL is critical for academic success, uh, particularly in K-12, but also in post-secondary careers or college work. I think we'd all agree that social emotional skills and mindsets are crucial for you know, general career success, right? The way we interact with people, deal with adversity, uh, manage our time and our work. Um, and lots of connections here to, of course, to executive functioning. And finally, it's also important, of course, for our health and well-being. And this might actually be the, the most important aspect of this for the module series if, in general, in terms of you know, the new challenges and the context that we're entering in for reopening. So you had some pre-work before this session. Um, I hope you all had a chance to read or at least skim the articles. The first two articles uh, that you see here were sent out to you. Um, these are focused primarily on expanding our thoughts about the ways in which SEL intersects with important areas of racial equity uh, and, and equity and inclusion in general. The third article that was sent to you, um, which is really more of a practical guide, offers practical strategies for creating a space where academic and SEL goals are accomplished basically side by side. Um, it also provides great advice for implementing culturally responsive pedagogy and describes how teachers can bring anti-bias values to life. So as you can see in this slide, it, it covers a variety of areas. For example, engaging families and communities in ways that are meaningful and culturally competent and using instructional strategies that support diverse learning styles uh, and allow for deep exploration of anti-bias themes. So that was a longer article. And if you didn't get a chance to read the whole thing, uh, just keep it in your, uh, in your folder, in your repository, and, and perhaps you can you know, look at it at a later date. But it's a great, great resource to have. In connection with those readings, um, I just want to emphasize the following. When we think about um, SEL and we think about uh, uh, equity issues, we want to recognize that you know, we can't really promote SEL outside of the current socio-political and racial context. Um, I'll quote uh, Dina Simmons, who says that social emotional learning skills can help us build communities that foster courageous conversations across difference so that our students can confront injustice, hate, and inequity. We also want to resist thinking in siloed terms when it comes to social emotional learning, academics, and equity. 
that's a big one. I think today we still battle this. Uh, you know, often SEL sits way outside of academics and is looked at as very separate, when in fact they're um, very much interwoven. Want to adopt trauma-informed practices. And of course we want to be, uh, we want the center, want to center the experiences, needs, and values of students uh, and families and the communities and kind of think of these as a, as a collective unit. And in doing so, you know, again, really hone in on aspects of SEL, such as agency, which I hadn't mentioned before, but we think about agency, it's really a person's capacity and propensity to formulate intentions and take initiative to achieve those uh, goals. Um, and that's based on a sense of purpose, individual goals uh, and needs. And so again, um, under that last bullet, I, I, would, I would emphasize the need for uh, agency. So let's take some time to reflect on your readings. Um, first, we'll do a five minute self-reflection with the two prompts above, right? Um, and then we'll move into a group share. And so after your individual reflection, you'll come together um, and you can either in the chat box or verbally uh, in whatever form you're using, uh, whatever platform you're using, um, just identify some common themes, uh, again, to the extent that you're comfortable. Um, are there areas in practice, policy, or general interactions that might be improved, um, and how? The two props above for the individual reflection. How do existing policies and practices in your school uh, or classroom address, uphold, or break down dominant cultural norms, right? And think about discipline policies, discipline actions, uh, routines, interactions between students and adults or adults and adults. Um, and then as an educator, what types of mindsets do you bring to the classroom and with your and what are your mindsets with interactions with peers? What biases do you think um, you might carry or observe in others? Um, so I have these two prompts, but really, you know, you can reflect on any aspect of the reading that you felt was was uh, relevant. So at this moment, I'll ask the facilitator to pause this slide and after 10 minutes, uh, press play again. Okay, so there's an enormous spectrum of social emotional learning competencies, skills, mindsets, et cetera. Um, given that we're upon reopening and uh, we're experiencing distance learning, the district has prioritized basically for the moment anyway, two really important areas of SEL, social awareness and relationship skills. On the outset, you know, these are obviously things most of us all know about, but there are elements of each that perhaps are new and uh, that we can dive into. And <clears throat> if nothing else, uh, perhaps this will serve just as a strong refresher, a reminder of areas that we wanna focus in. So we look at social awareness. This involves the ability to understand, to empathize, feel compassion for those with different backgrounds or cultures, for our peers. Relationship skills help students and adults establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships and to act in accordance with, with social norms. So let's dive a little deeper into social awareness. Social awareness is the ability to take the perspective of and empathize with others from diverse backgrounds and cultures, to understand social and ethical norms for behavior, and to recognize family, school, and community resources uh, and supports. Research suggests that students with strong social awareness adapt more easily to their environment, empathize with the perspective of others, and engage in fewer disruptive classroom behaviors. Students who demonstrate strong social awareness are able to engage in constructive communication with their peers and resolve conflicts when they arise. These students benefit from peer learning and know how to take advantage of social supports. And so we're not going to dive too deep into the various components, but if you see below in this graphic here, um, you know, emotional intelligence, intelligence is a big part of that. Social capital, perspective taking, and cultural competency. What are some of the benefits? Positive classroom climate. Students with strong social awareness adapt more easily to their environment. Better relationships, as I mentioned before. Uh, fewer risky behaviors. Students are, are able to adapt to new environments, 
uh, understand typically the needs and perspective of others, and they know where they can get support when they need it. They're less prone to emotional distress and less likely to engage in those risky behaviors, such as drug use uh, and aggression. And that obviously can interfere with school success. Um, and then <clears throat> also greater career success. An employer survey conducted by the Partnership for 21st Century Skills uh, recently demonstrated that four of the five most important skills for high school graduates entering the workforce are linked to social awareness. Professionalism, collaboration, communication, and social responsibility. So researchers have identified multiple stages in the development of perspective taking, which are described in more detail here. So I'm gonna leave this slide up. <clears throat> um, you know, I'll, I'll sit for about 30 seconds or so. So you have time to read through these various grade levels. As you're doing that, obviously think about the grades that you're connected to specifically. So we look through the slide chart with the five develop, developmental stages ages three to six, undifferentiated perspective taking, six to eight, social informational or subjective perspective taking, and self-reflective perspective taking, third party perspective taking, and societal perspective taking. All right, so I'm going to move to the next slide, but obviously if you're facilitating, feel free to pause that slide if, if folks need to uh, have more time looking at it. So I'm going to watch a quick video. Uh, as you watch this, consider the ways in which these the students in the video describe the benefits of social awareness uh, in their work and in their relationships. And then as a personal reflection, how has social awareness benefited you as an adult? I know my friends are sad because they usually tell me when they're feeling sad because it's just you can tell what they're going through. I have like happy friends like every time when I walk in the door they'll like hug or have a like handshake or anything they'll just be normally happy but if one of my friends are sad you can like tell they'll be like head down not feeling good or just not in a like energetic mood. When we first started doing per group projects and I was sort of, I knew myself that it was tough to read others' emotions and to know where they came from and how to work with others, mainly because I didn't have the skill that we were talking about to go and make the effort to go engage in like conversation with somebody to learn and adjust to what they think we care about each other and when we come to school it's not just about doing math or reading we want to know what's going on with you as a person a time when i was struggling it was in social studies class again and i was sort of just slumped down in my chair my teacher came to me and asked me you know what's wrong what's going on with you is there anything i can do to help and it was at the beginning of class so i sort of just talked it out a little bit, and um, eventually I was just able to do my work. My basketball coach for when I was younger, he would, we would always have new people coming onto our team, and like, I was there for a while. So they, they always wanted the people that have been on the team to sort of ease in the new players. He just huddled us over and he said, look, the new guys, they look a little, a little stiff go loosen them up a little bit, ask them about how their day was and all that stuff. It really just, it's just a skill that's great to have because not only are you helping yourself, but you're helping another person open up. And I think that's really important. All right, Okay, <clears throat> so 
Again, we're not going to uh, take time to uh, discuss the reflection, although if you're the facilitator and want to, you can certainly pause this. Um, otherwise, I'll move on to the next slide. So let's explore a, so a small sample of some evidence-based strategies around social awareness. Uh, again, some of you uh, may be doing these. Um, and <clears throat> some of you uh, may find some of these a little bit new. Um, these were chosen in part because um, they're for, for all K, uh, K to 12 uh, grade levels. Um, these ones in particular, um, were, we, I was thinking more about grades through K through five, um, but they apply to all grades, as you'll see. So journal writing. What is it? Journal writing, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, entails providing students with the opportunity to regularly reflect on experiences through writing. Frequent journal writing can help students reflect on academic content, as well as their emotional connection to the material, their peers, and their teachers. By regularly identifying their emotions and the emotions of others, students will develop their ability to recognize, understand, and label emotions. I think that the key word here too is frequency. Um, I know that when I taught, I did a couple assignments that involved some journal writing, but I don't think I did it nearly as often as I should have. And I think that's when it becomes, um, well, we know that's when it becomes more effective. Um, so just some sample prompts below. You know, how do you feel about the group's effort towards finishing the assignment? So that could be a prompt after some group work. Um, how did participants treat one another throughout the project? How did it feel to work in this particular group? And so again, when you're, when you're doing these prompts regularly, it forces students uh, to, to take the time to reflect back on those experiences. Uh, a sample journal assignment includes having students record their reflections after each project or assignment for which they work to in a group. So throughout the year, uh, students would maintain a journal that is frequently reviewed by the teacher. Um, and again, these kinds of prompts can elicit reflection in order to have students practice identifying and labeling emotions. Uh, and this is important at all grade levels. Cooperative learning, uh, what is it? Well, it takes place when students work together toward a common goal, typically in small teams of students with varying abilities. Why is it beneficial? It helps students understand peers' perspectives and incorporate these perspectives into decision-making. And how do you do it? Many of you, I'm sure, are incorporating this in your class now. Uh, cooperative learning works best when students work together to complete the assignment, are held accountable for the group's final outcome, and they use interpersonal skills, such as decision-making, conflict resolution, and effective communication. And they reflect on team strengths and weaknesses for improvement. Again, many of you probably already use this kind of a strategy uh, in your daily routines or your weekly uh, routines. I think the, the thing that's important here is that um, there are two, two pieces. One is at the very end there, um, the, the explicit time that you're taking for that to have the students reflect. Uh, and that's where you could in involve journal writing as well, uh, but really to reflect back on <clears throat> the experience that they, they just had. And then I think the other important thing is that although some of us may already be doing these in the classroom, um, I think part of, of this in today's module is also to say that like, yes, we're incorporating some of these strategies. We're also explicitly or being explicit about the fact that these directly relate to some of these social emotional competencies. And so as a result, we can be a little more intentional perhaps on the objectives we're looking for at the end of uh, a lesson or at the end of a project where they're using that. So it might not just be the actual outcome of the, that they're producing, um, but again, how well did they work together? Uh, how well did they listen together? Did they resolve their conflicts uh, or at least learn from them? Also wanna mention uh, media and emotions. This is a, a great one to use because it's so accessible uh, and particularly important uh, while we're engaged in virtual learning. So what is it, what am, what am I talking about? Well, students, as you know, are exposed to various forms of media on a daily basis. Um, and so in this example, we use the media to help students understand the use of emotions, as well as develop their ability to recognize and label emotions. And why is it beneficial? Well, we know regularly discussing and analyzing social media can empower students to recognize emotions and the impact that they might have on others. How do you do it? Students can analyze commercials, uh, develop their own commercials, 
or think about the forms of media, uh, think about Snapchat or Twitter or TikTok um, and how they relate to emotions. High school students, for example, might analyze political commercials or social media ads. Um, and elementary school students might identify pictures about products or services to identify the emotions they're intended to elicit. Um, for example, you know, advertisements often intend to manipulate our emotions. A product commercial may try to invoke sadness, uh, happiness, laughter, anger, all in 30 seconds with the intent of gaining our trust or changing our ideas or our desires. And so uh, children may be surprised at how easily their emotions can be manipulated. It's a really great, uh, useful strategy. Okay, so let's take a few minutes, uh, about seven minutes total. Uh, do a little couple minutes of individual reflection, right? Think back to the previous slides, some of those strategies. How have you used uh, some of these strategies? How have you seen these skills develop in students around social awareness? Are there other useful strategies you've adopted that I didn't mention? Uh, and then we'll come back together as a large group and participants can take five minutes to write in the chat box again or share a reflection verbally uh, for that five minutes. So I'll ask the facilitator now to pause and come back and uh, press play uh, around seven or eight minutes. Okay, so moving on to relationship building. Obviously we know this is important. Um, positive relationships in schools are important for families, uh, teachers and students. And we know from research that positive social interactions can support students' social and academic development. They also help students feel safe and supported. And what makes a teacher-student relationship positive? Mutual respect, and supports, open communication, empathy, warmth, and genuineness, closeness, trust, care, and cooperation. I just wanted to share this quote quickly. I, I, I love this quote by Brene Brown, where she says, I define connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. <clears throat> I think the key uh, here is uh, w when folks feel seen, heard, and valued. That's really important as we think about relationships. Seen, heard, and valued. So going back to some research, we know that relationships skills matter for adults as well. Um, and we also know Sorry, just fixing this slide. We also know that positive teacher-student relationships promote student engagement, social emotional development, safety and belonging, uh, and obviously academic growth. Um, we know that teachers who build positive relationships with students report experiences of joy and less feelings of anxiety and anger. Uh, this is the slide I skipped ahead to a second ago, uh, but what I was trying to say is that relationships, of course, it's not just about the student and the, and the teacher, but also the adults uh, in the building. I won't read this quote verbatim, but I'll pause here just for a minute for those of you to um, take a second to read through it. I think this slide is particularly important uh, as we, again, are uh, entering into a, a new phase um, in education with distance learning. Um, I think it's more important than ever that we uh, think about the relationships we have uh, with our colleagues, as well as our students and families. For example, think about relationships between administrators and, and teachers. Right, and positive relationships in that uh, area can help teachers develop skills and practices, obviously, can mitigate factors that lead to teacher turnover, uh, and really serve as a model for students on what healthy and positive relationships in the workplace look like.
So let's watch this video. Uh, as you watch, think about all the intentional ways that adults build relationships in this video. On a personal reflection, um, based on the video and your experience, why are healthy relationships in schools so important? You had so much to offer yesterday. You're okay? tired. So what's going on? Strong relationships are central to the learning process. What the science of learning and development tells us is that we need to create learning environments which allow for strong long-term relationships for children to become attached to school and to the adults and other children in it. When children have experiences of closeness and consistency and trust, oxytocin is released. Oxytocin has many, many positive effects on the development of the brain. So when we think about a relationship, we're not just talking about being nice to a child. We're talking about a child having an experience of attunement and trust strong enough to release the hormone oxytocin. Good morning, Ariella. How you doing today? The purpose of the morning greeting is to connect with them and to just make sure that I'm seeing them as humans. Like I'm making that relationship with them, making that bond. I prioritize relationship building because getting to know them is the best part of the job. When I come in in the morning, we usually talk about things that are happening in our community. We're trying to build caring and respect. The teacher is trying to understand who I am and my values as a person. When I have a free 45 minutes or an hour, I think to myself, I could sit down and catch up on grading, or I could go and make connections, whether it's a smile or a joke or a reminder. It validates their presence in the building. Rock it out in the art room. It starts from so much honesty and transparency with kids. It's really easy to strive to be this like idealized, always ready to go elementary school teacher. And that's not real and that's not human. When people start talking about other things while I'm still giving directions, it feels frustrating for me and I have to take a breath. My students connect most with me when they see that I also struggle and I also have challenges. It takes a lot of vulnerability on my part. When that student knows that you care about them, when they know that you're a human, Let's think about that. their academic performance in your class is going to be better. If I'm comfortable around them, then I'm more confident around them, and it's easier to ask questions and things like that. So when you're looking at this graph, what is it that you think happened? Some teachers I don't always get along with the best, so then sometimes I'm like, I can't do it, so I'm just not going to do it. But when I like the teacher, I want to do their work. I'll be like, I can learn this. You all have done outstanding work. Emotion and learning are completely connected. <laughs> if you're in a positive emotional space, if you feel good about yourself, your teacher, that actually opens up the opportunity for more learning. Good to see. Uh, uh, Great. So <clears throat> here's the thing. Uh, for many educators, relationships come easy. Uh, I think that they did for me as a teacher and a coach. Um, but for some, however, it's really hard to develop relationships outside of content and the context of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Additionally, even those of us who pride ourselves on strong relationships, I would encourage you to, or us to think to ourselves, you know, do we have this relationship with all students? Um, and if not, why not? You know, what's an obstacle to, to developing a strong relationships with a student uh, for whom you might have nothing in common? Uh, I know that I had strong relationships with students that I happened to have things in common with, whether it was a love of history or sports or music. Um, but there are certainly some, some students I, I had trouble finding ways to connect with and probably didn't make as strong of an effort as I should have um, to try to bridge that connection. 
So we're going to look at a couple strategies here. Um, I think you'll really like uh, relationship mapping. That's a that's a favorite of mine and, and a popular one with uh, folks that we work with across the U.S. Um, <clears throat> emotional check-ins, uh, dialogue circles, and wise critical feedback. Just a quick reminder that uh, uh, we are, of course, entering into distance learning. And so just a reminder that, you know, we're mostly probably using laptops and computers for communication, but we also have phone calls. Uh, we have postcards and letters. Um, I've read many stories of, of principals who are sending postcards to students who may not have access to Wi-Fi or, or limited access. And then, of course, there are YouTube videos, TikTok videos, and other social media platforms that, uh, that we can use. I am pausing just for a second here to redo my screen. I'm not sure uh, why it's... Not doing full screen, sorry about that. Okay, so relationship mapping, uh, what is it? This is a strategy to identify which students have strong connections with adults and make a plan for how to see every student. Because remember, we want every student to feel seen, heard, and valued. Um, this can be used by administrators, educators, and support staff. And this can definitely be used um, on a virtual learning platform. So I'm gonna play a video, but if you look to the right, <clears throat> you'll see a, an example of what this relationship mapping looks like, uh, where essentially you're listening out to each student in your classroom or your grade level, or even maybe the, the entire school, um, and identifying, you know, do I know the student's name and face? Do I know about their academics? Do I know any personal stories? Do I know their family? Every student walks through the door wanting to feel valued. Every child deserves to have at least one adult in this building who knows them by name. We want 100% of our students to feel connected to a teacher in our building, and that's our goal. It was just a matter of how do we measure this? Early in the year, we conduct a teacher-student connection poster activity so that we can determine which students we've connected with and which students we need to work toward connecting with. Delaney is ordered to write a food dye. Yeah. And she also has a pond that she swims in. <laughs> we take their whole roster of students, we put it up on a wall, and we ask teachers to go through by name and face. Yep, I know this one, this one, this one. No ball. All by name and face. Yep. I think that was a team goal by the end of the second week. What? Yeah. End of week two. The activity was based around how well do you know your students. Just through this simple, you know, adding a check mark next to the kid's name that you know by name and face, and then the other categories, academic status, and then a more in-depth personal story about them. Yeah. Someone that slips under the radar, though. It's just pretty quiet. You look at a lot of kids and you go, hey, this student has one check mark. I know them by name and face, but other than that, I don't know where they're at academically. I don't know anything about their personal life. It's probably harder for them to feel valued in a learning environment without that connection to the teacher. So to me, that's what this was all about, a reflective process. How well are we getting to know our kids? And so you don't get to know those students. The stones in the river, that's what I like to call them. They're just letting the water wash over them. We gotta go pick up that stone and turn it over. We want them to reflect, and then it's time to develop an action plan. What are we going to do to make sure that these students are taken care of? We have personal conversations with our students in the hallways during passing time. We also do things like um, thumbs up Thursdays at, or feel good Fridays and we just take a few seconds to have kids share things that they're proud of. To get to know the kids a little bit better on a personal level, just asking them a simple question as they come in the door. Example, last week I started off by just asking kids what their favorite food or fruit was. And then those questions can get deeper to try and get you know a little more personal. Winter. 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 Summer. Nice. The students here should be seen as people and not just pupils. 
the more valued they are for their individuality, the more successful they're going to be in the classroom, the more risks they're going to be willing to take, and that's, that's awesome. We have seen a huge increase in our students' connection to school with their connection to the teachers, and I think that's probably the most joy teachers have in their profession. Then the real work can begin. Excellent. So, what we'd like to do now is uh, pause for about five minutes. Um, and before you hit the pause button, I'll just mention that uh, I would take a, a minute or so and just read through um, how to do relationship mapping based on the video you just watched. And then just take three to five minutes <clears throat> discussing as a group. What do you think about this strategy? And also, how can we get to know the students who don't really have many check marks? Okay, so pause here and press play when you're finished. Some of you are probably familiar with this, but I wanna share with you uh, a super simple but effective strategy called the mood meter. This is developed by the Yale Center for Emotional uh, <clears throat> Intelligence. Um, basically, this can be used for regularly checking in with students at the beginning of a class, uh, before a test, um, or especially in the distance learning era, um, you know, as soon as you are uh, getting onto uh, the computer with a, a student one-on-one -on -one or in a, in a group. Um, can also be done with adults as well. And we want to emphasize in this, as, you're, as you look through the slide here, that um, you know, all emotions are valid. And this is partly what are the, one of the things that this, using this tool accomplishes. Um, it's the students themselves in this work here, in the mood meter, who are identifying how they feel, not the teacher. So we don't want teachers to try to guess where students are in the mood meter or use it as a way to force compliance, but rather we want students to feel empowered to name their own emotions and decide what they want to do and how they want to feel in a particular moment. And also on a side note, to support your ELL learners uh, and students who may benefit from having access to words that describe emotions, um, you, know, you can use su simple sentence starters uh, like these ones on the slide or provide a word chat um, that students can use to describe their feelings uh, more in depth. So you'll see the sentence starters on the right and at the top, and you can Google um, the mood meter uh, very easily, but essentially you're looking at, you know, high energy levels um, and uh, the pleasantness that you might be feeling, uh, if you're feeling a little, little bit unpleasant, a little low energy, and identifying those emotions, you as the, and hearing from students, you as the teacher have a sense of where students are coming from. But again, as individuals identify those emotions, um, they can start thinking about strategies to uh, move them to a different place if they want to. Another strategy, which I have found throughout the country is incredibly effective, uh, circles. For those that are familiar with restorative justice, you know, this is a critical piece of that. Um, and there are several types of circles. Uh, some are focused primarily on restoring relationships based on personal issues or disciplinary actions to resolve conflicts. Others are focused more on community building uh, academic interventions or peacemaking. Dialogue circles, which I'm sort of focusing more on in this particular slide, can encompass elements of all of these, uh, but are generally used to strengthen relationships through discussion on a topic designated by the adult or student facilitator. So these circles can be used to uh, leverage um, certain content that you're teaching, um, or can be used to discuss uh, issues of conflict within the classroom, or to simply ask about students' weekends uh, or share their thoughts on it, really any topic that, that you want. So how do you do it? Dialogue circles are gathering, are gathering in which all participants literally sit in a circle facing each other to facilitate open, direct communication. And dialogue circles provide a safe, supportive space where all school community members can talk about sensitive topics. It's also important for the, for the facilitator to be willing to be a little bit vulnerable in those moments. 
In your pre-reading, uh, you were provided with a fairly thorough guide uh, from uh, Oakland Unified School District, and I think in, in uh, partnership with Edutopia, it's a great um, starting guidance. Uh, it gives you a lot of information about how to prep for those, those circles. The last strategy I want to mention, which like the others is uh, pretty simple, is the regular use of wise critical feedback. I'm sure many of us are thinking, you know, yeah, I already do this. Um, um, as a former teacher, I know I did this to some extent, but I would encourage you to think about how often you really do it. Um, I think I, I think I did it, for example, but I think I only, I didn't do it nearly as frequently as I, I thought. And I still teach now, although I teach at the college level, but I still don't know that I, I uh, implement wise critical feedback as often as, as I should. And <clears throat> it's very simple, okay? How do you do it? What is it all about? It's basically just written or verbal feedback to students um, that you have high standards for the student and that you believe in the student's ability to meet those standards. It's very simple, but there's actually been a good amount of research on it um, that shows that it can strengthen student-teacher relationships by mitigating mistrust that may exist due to a student's perception uh, that bias plays a role in the feedback provided by an educator. Um, it's also been shown to improve students' academic outcomes. And research has also found that the strategy is especially effective in grades 7 to 12, particularly with students of color and students from low-income communities. So again, very simple. Uh, but I think the key is frequency. All right, so let's have the facilitator pause for five minutes and then press play when the reflection and discussion is finished. And the prompts are right below on the slide. Feel free to use the chat box again if you have access or verbally share. Okay, well, I hope that was a fruitful uh, discussion. Again, these practices aren't super complicated, of course, and many of you might already be doing them or some variation of them. But I think part of the purpose of this was to serve as a refresher of things we want to prioritize entering this new uh, school year in the fall. Um, and it's certainly a somewhat unorthodox school year. So uh, looking at next steps, um, let's continue to leverage the resources provided when preparing for this upcoming school year. You've had, you have your pre-reads pre and um, you should have access to these slides as well. Um, you want to leverage your peer network and administrators uh, willing to provide extra support, particularly from the social emotional learning specialist office of, uh, and the climate of, uh, sorry, the office of climate and culture. Um, also want to be preparing for the second module, which will focus on integrating these strategies and practices into your classroom. Your facilitator will email you the pre-work following this module, and my colleague Moni Anjali will be um, facilitators talking through the next uh, slide deck. So I want to thank you all. Uh, I know that you're all super busy, and I appreciate your time and, and wish you the best. And um, I hope my voice was uh, not too relaxing and actually somewhat engaging uh, during this presentation. So thanks very much, and enjoy your day.